Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Hardcore Finance Show. Uh, today is a solo episode that I wanted to do uh, following several um, conference appearances that I had at um, the Digital Asset Summit uh, in London, uh, as well as the Bitcoin Collective in Edinburgh. Uh, the Bitcoin Collective one was really fun uh, because I, I was on a panel with Adam Back, who's um, one of the original, um, you know, one of the people that was um, cited on the Bitcoin white paper. Um, and he was one of the original inventors of, of hashing and how it can be used uh, for different um, for different purposes. And, you know, a bunch of uh, questions came up about how will Bitcoin help um, people generate a higher quality of life, uh, given the fact that it's basically privatized money. And, you know, I have two other videos on this channel called The Privatization of Money, where I go through the, the concept of what is a privatization, why governments do that, and um, why Bitcoin can be considered a privatization of money, especially if governments uh, don't shut it down. And given the recent effects of FTX and regulation and all of these things, um, I wanted to revisit this topic with a fresh set of eyes and really talk about the, the optimistic case uh, from a government perspective. So not the optimistic case from an investor who wants to just like, uh, you know, outperform the stock market, but, um, but from a government, what, what will a government gain from Bitcoin being adopted? And so uh, I'll do a quick recap of, of two, three minutes of the previous points of the privatization of money. And then um, we can go deep into what is new um, due to FTX and also the concept of why privatization could be a good thing from a slightly different perspective. So in the previous two privatization of money episodes, I basically um, mentioned that it, there are many cases under which the government controls something and they really don't have any forcing function to give it up, but they choose to give it up. Uh, they choose to sell it to a private corporation and, um, and have this private corporation develop it. Um, and for example, uh, recently in Israel, they discovered a bunch of natural gas uh, off the coast of Israel, you know, the government could have said, we will develop it, we will uh, maintain, a, keep 100% of the profits, uh, because it's our, you know, our gas. Um, but instead, what they did is they, uh, they, they do privatization on two tranches. One tranche is letting people explore. And then if they find something, they get to keep the rights to privately exploit it. And which they don't have to do, right? Like the government can just say, oh, you explore. And then once you find the gas, we just take it from you. Uh, you know, that's an alternative. They have a Navy, right? The, the private uh, investors who explore the waters do not have a Navy. So, so that's like one option. Uh, another option is they can say, okay, you explored it. You found it. Here, we're going to pay. We're, we're going to buy out your rights and we will develop it ourselves as a government. Um, but they don't do that either. Uh, they basically say the opposite. A private company can develop it and then just give us a percentage of the profit. So why do they do this? They do this because, A, as a government, uh, they don't necessarily have the, the best capabilities to, uh, you know, uh, be able to effectively operate in many different industries. Um, and so, and, and then building those capabilities is kind of risky and governments are not very good capital allocators. And so that's why they basically say, look, like the private sector knows how to operate in, in different industries in a much more efficient way. And, uh, and they basically have run the numbers and seen that like a 20% gain on the profits of something operated very efficiently is more uh, tax revenue than um, you know, uh, 100% um, of, of profits generated by the government. And you can see this in the reverse as well. So nationalization is the opposite of privatization. It's when the government takes over a public company. It can be a public company that failed or it, uh, sorry, uh, um, the government takes over a private company. So it can be a private company that failed, uh, but it also can be a, uh, a, a, a private company that's very successful and then the government just like takes it over 
and uh, just just because you know the communists did that after the Bolshevik Revolution, and in Venezuela they did it. Uh, so there's many, many, uh, the Nazi regime in Germany uh, of Hitler uh, kind of semi did it. So they basically said, look, corporations can keep operating, but we'll have like government representatives making sure that they operate according to what the government wants. Uh, and so basically, and it's kind of scary, you know, when you listen to the World Economic Forum talking about public private partnerships, you know, that always raises a big flag, a red flag, like, why do you need a public private partnership? as opposed to just a private company. <laughs> so like why, you know, what, what is the public, uh, AKA the government adding to this partnership? Uh, but in any case, the, the idea is privatization works because it's a uh, private sector is more efficient than the government. Now, and, and, and basically when we look at Bitcoin, we can say this is the, um, privatization of money. So the government can create money. Money is a, is a product. It's a good, like any other good, right? The, the, um, I think that the definition of money, it's the most saleable good. It's like the, the good that is, is, has the most liquidity and the most people accept it. So it's easy to buy and easy to sell it. Uh, so, you know, now we're in a regime where the government controls the production of money. And, and you could say that the Federal Reserve in the U.S. kind of is like is, is the ultra government that controls the money of all the, the world. Because the way it works is if uh, the Fed decides something about interest rates, uh, if other governments do not match that decision and decide to go against it, their currency will be completely destroyed. And since the U.S. has the most economic influence currently... Uh, you know, and it's the U.S. plus Europe. I think those two um, political bodies are very closely coordinated, right? So that's like a big chunk of the world economy. That's if you think about it, it's like almost like a billion people. But it's also a billion people that are very, very, um, you know, capital rich. So they have a lot of capital at their disposal. So, you know, that's like the vast majority of the world. And so it's really, really hard to go against the Fed. So if you think about it, the Fed is basically the global government for money production. Uh, so if we agree that the Fed is the, the, the global government of money production, uh, we can think, okay, what will happen if they somehow, and, and forget about the catalyst right now, uh, I don't want to, you know, speculate too much on like what will cause it. If you have listened to a lot of the conversations I've had with Alex on this podcast, it's like really, really hard to predict the exact time that something will happen, right? So we knew, for example, that like as the Fed increases interest rates, the stock market and crypto will crash. But knowing exactly where the bottom is or knowing exactly like, you know, after how many consecutive interest rates will FTX go bust, that's really hard. But, uh, but you can in generally know that when interest rates go up, you know, the, the asset values will go down and, and vice versa. So it's the same when we talk about privatization, let's assume that something happens and, you know, the Federal Reserve decides to privatize money and then they're very happy about it for some reason. How could that be? And so my thesis in the previous two episodes was that it could be because it's just much more efficient. So if you think of money as, an, as a machine that does something, as a good that does something, which is basically coordinating people's wants and needs, uh, you know, avoiding barter and, and being able to store some value into the future without um, speculating on it. And it basically the definition of money, it's like it's kind of risk-free to hold it. Although we, we know it's not risk-free. There's nothing risk-free in this world, by the way. So, uh, you know, holding money, the risk that you take is that the purchasing power of that money will go down in the future. And, and then the interest rate that they pay you is supposed to offset that, you know, in, in, in kind of like a perfectly balanced economical model of, of macroeconomics, you basically say the interest that you get uh, by the central bank should kind of reflect the price increases uh, that are expected, uh, plus the risk of the government not paying back your bonds. So, you know, with the U.S., since it's kind of considered risk-free, uh, the interest rate should reflect the kind of long-term inflation expectations. And in a country like Turkey or Argentina or something, you have the inflation expectations plus the uh, chance of the government not paying you back uh, because uh, they can default. So 
why would privatizing the system make it more efficient? So the idea is that, you know, when the government runs it, uh, it, it cannot really predict the inter- the right interest rate. So it cannot, uh, no matter how many economic PhDs work at the Federal Reserve, it's really, really hard to take into account all of the variables um, and, and predict what the inflation rate will be and set the interest rate to affect that inflation, to, to, to basically match that inflation. It's really, really hard. And some people say that it cannot even be done. You know, it's like the weather. Uh, no matter how many smart people and supercomputers we have analyzing the weather, it's really hard to predict what the weather will be uh, today, a year from now, like November 28th, uh, 2023. Uh, almost impossible to predict the weather. Uh, so, so it's like you could say on average, uh, you know, this is, you know, let's take all of the November 28th that have been until now and, and see you know, the average, but you'll just get a very, very wide range of of, um, uh, of basically error bars in, in, in your statistical analysis. And so the average is not very, uh, you know, the chance that you will hit the average uh, is very, very low. So with the weather, it's less important because, you know, maybe the average is 10 degrees plus minus. And so no problem. I'll just like have a jacket. Oh, I'll be a little cold or, oh, I'll, I'll have to carry a jacket or, you know, carry an umbrella. Yes or no. But like with money, it's actually really, really important to get this thing right. Because if you set an interest rate that's above the the inflation, uh, the price inflation that is expected, then, you know, the economy will grow not as fast as it can. And if you set an interest rate that's below that, uh, there's other problems with import and export. And it's just like, it it causes a lot of harm. And so the idea is like, if you privatize the money, you will basically have a natural uh, interest rate. And in in, in the sense of Bitcoin doesn't pay any interest. So think of it as a zero coupon bond for for people uh, that don't know what a zero coupon bond is. You you have usually a bond that has a coupon. So it's like, uh, you know, a coupon of 2%. You get like, let's say I I buy $100 of these bonds. Every year I will get like $2 and and that's my coupon. And let's say the bond is for 10 years. So, you know, I I give them $100 every year, I'll get $2. And and after 10 years, I'll get $102 and and that's it. So with a zero coupon bond basically means I will not get anything every year, but like at the end I will get, you know, the the equivalence of all the coupons that, that I was supposed to get along the way. So it's, it's basically like the price of the bond reflects the, um, the, the coupons. So you're not getting any cash flow from it, but it just the price of the bond keeps increasing. And if you sell it and if you just hold it, the, the price at the end, you can know it for a fact what it will be. So Bitcoin is like a zero coupon bond. And, you know, during this privatized, uh, let's say everybody uses Bitcoin all over the world, the idea is that the interest rate of the, um, the, the, the the appreciation, the price appreciation of Bitcoin will uh, better reflect the overall economy and uh, the overall economic gains than what the government could do. And so that could be better. And because it's better, we'll have lower unemployment, higher growth, all of these things that come with a more efficient engine uh, that's called, uh, you know, money. But this is just an engine, just like a, a good or service, like any other good or service, the better the service, the more efficient uh, the economy. Now, that was a quick summary of what we discussed until now, but I wanted to raise something else. I wanted to talk about politics. So a big problem of centralized systems is that it, it becomes like a honeypot for powerful people to try to take over. So, uh, you know, even if the people who set up uh, the system have the best of intentions, let's say we have a social credit score system that is really, really good. And it, it basically looks at everything you do and, uh, you know, gives you advantages and disadvantages based on whether the things you do are good. Let's say for you, let, let's, let's be very, very altruistic. Let's say we have an altruistic person take over China or let's say that 
uh, Xi Jinping uh, wakes up one morning completely reprogrammed and he's like the most altruistic person that ever existed. And he's like, I want to make the world a better place. So let's take my social credit score system and perfect it, not so not such that the government will benefit from it, but so people will benefit. So let's say they take 10 years and they perfect the social credit score system. It's like, oh, you used your, your money to buy alcohol. That's not good for you. So we're going to give you, uh, I don't know, a discount for a gym uh, in the beginning. But then if you don't use the discount for the gym, then we'll start like increasing the cost of alcohol for you. Uh, so you consume less and less of it and they roll it out and it's amazing and uh, cancer rates go down and traffic accidents go down and everything is great. And let's say you can do this across many dimensions and have like the perfect central bank digital currency that basically it's almost like money plus an AI personal assistant all in one and it just makes sure that you spend your money in the best possible way. And this could be a utopia, like if you listen to the World Economic Forum, you would think that this is a utopia. Uh, you could say, oh, uh, I'm about to enroll my child into this daycare uh, and pay for it. And suddenly you get like a, a pop-up that says, you know what, for you, this daycare is 30% more expensive because guess what? This other daycare down the road is actually 30% more expensive for everybody. But we know that your child will benefit from the teachers there more. So we want to like equalize the price. So we don't want you to buy the more the cheaper uh, daycare, uh, we want you to go to the more expensive one. So we'll just normalize the price. We'll make all the daycares cost the same. We'll maybe even give you a slight discount to the good daycare. And, uh, and, and then it's better for everybody, right? So like that's the utopia that the World Economic Forum imagines. Let's say that it actually happens. And then you have someone uh, within the government that says, uh, wait a second. If I can just tweak one variable in this uh, central bank digital currency, uh, it will really, really help my party. You know, it will really help me uh, be reelected. So let's say it's like, oh, you know, if if I uh, tweak this this one thing, then this province that uh, votes for me uh, or votes for my opponent uh, will disproportionately uh, benefit. And so I will go and I'll campaign and I'll say to these guys, uh, you know, vote for me and then you will get these benefits. Or, uh, you know, if you don't vote for me, I'll take away these benefits from you. Uh, and so then what will happen is that slowly powerful people, people that have a lot of power will be able to corrupt this perfect system to their advantage. Now, from the government's perspective, that's not good because it will reduce their tax revenue. Remember, in our um, in our original thought experiment, we said that the uh, government is benevolent and, and wants you know the, the maximum benefit for everybody. But from the point of view of that powerful person, it makes things better, right? And you get this like in many places, for example, again, I'm not uh, huge into uh, US politics, but I, I know Israeli politics. So uh, I can give you a, a concrete example of how this happens. So uh, let's say the people who built Israel's educational system, and they're very good people, very smart people. Uh, and they basically said, look, Israel has pretty much like four uh, seg segments of the population. You have secular Jews, mildly religious Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews and Arabs, and they're equally 25% of the population, each of these. And so what they did is they built four separate uh, public education systems. So it's all free, uh, and you can choose where to send your kids to, but, you know, ultra-Orthodox choose to send their kids to ultra-Orthodox schools where they teach, like, hardcore religion. Uh, Arabs tend, uh, send their kids to Arab schools where they uh, teach, you know, in Arabic and more like, uh, you know, history uh, that's about, you know, the Arab people. Uh, secular people like uh, my family, you know, sent me to a secular school where it's all about, like... Um, you know, Bible was, the Bible there was studied as a, as a, you know, piece of literature. And we were talking about like who wrote it in different periods. It was definitely not, uh, not like, you know, this is the word of God. And the, uh, the mildly religious people send their kids to a, 
uh, school that basically it's uh, it's boys and girls are sometimes taught separately, and uh, you know you study a, a lot more Bible, but you don't have to uh, be ultra orthodox with all uh, those restrictions. And so all of that is really good until the ultra orthodox decided that they don't want to teach math and English in their education system. So Israel, everybody speaks English really well, except for the ultra-Orthodox, which is going to be 25% of the population. They don't speak English. They don't learn math. So it's really, really hard for them to, uh, to function well in society. It's really hard for them to be productive. It's really hard for them to, uh, you know, um, deliver a quality of life for their families. And so what happens is, the rabbis or whoever is like those powerful people that lead the communities there, they, they actually want uh, people to be less uh, economically successful because they found a correlation between economic success and becoming less religious. So from their perspective, they want people to be the maximum amount of religious. And so they purposefully... Um, block math and English. And now they're going to form a new government where they're even going to pay more uh, to the people who don't study math and English, which is crazy, right? It, it, it's crazy. Either privatize the whole thing and each person gets a voucher and then they get to decide, you know, which, which uh, school to send their kids to, or nationalize everything and make everybody study math and English because that's that's like the minimum you need these days to be a productive member of society. At least math, you know, even if you say, oh, we're nationalistic, we don't want people to study English. At least math, super important, right? You cannot finish high school without knowing math. So, but why did this happen? It's because it's easy for this honeypot, this centralized uh, you know, government that decides this is going to be what people study and you only have four options and the options are so different from each other. Like an ultra-Orthodox is not going to send their kids to a secular school. It's not going to send their kids to a mildly religious school. It's definitely not going to send their kids to a, a Arab school. So basically they don't have any option. It's like a monopoly. And, um, and because it's a monopoly, it underperforms just like any other um, kind of economic theory that says a monopoly is less efficient than uh, competition. And so I just want to stress that point that by privatizing money, by having a money that's completely out of the control of every of, of any single party and cannot even be overtaken. So Bitcoin cannot, you cannot change the rules even if you control most of the Bitcoin. Uh, it, it's built really for maximum resilience. It's almost like the, the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. Uh, form of government was built to prevent someone from becoming king. That was literally the one thing that they wanted. They escaped from Europe. They had to negotiate with kings over there and, and, and they, they were traumatized. So they were like, we don't care if it's less efficient. We don't care if a jury uh, is, is less technically knowledgeable to judge someone in a trial. At least I know that it's not going to be the cronies of the king that are going to determine if I'm guilty or not. And so they're willing to take this lack of efficiency in order to prevent a honeypot that could be taken uh, control by people. And so it's the same with money. You know, uh, yes, Bitcoin is less efficient. You know, the Keynesians will tell you, no, in a depression, we need to be able to print money in order to. Uh, to, to basically spur people back into investment. And in a, in a um, time of boom, we're supposed to like shrink the money supply in order to like have dry powder that we can use in a depression. But guess what? Uh, in the times of boom, whenever someone says, I'll shrink the money supply, they just get voted out of office. And so it doesn't work. So, so that's the reason it's a honeypot that gets co-opted by powerful people. And that's the reason why Keynesians will never understand. Keynesians don't get human psychology. That's the problem. They, 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 they blame everything on animal spirits, which is like, that's all you need to know to understand that they don't uh, get human psychology. So the, it, it, this, this is what I wanted to say, that the privatization of money will prevent this honeypot from forming, which may be slightly less efficient than the optimal state, but it's definitely much, much more efficient than the default state, which is like powerful people taking over the honeypot 
and doing whatever they want uh, to benefit themselves over society. And it's really nice to see, actually, recently I'm seeing more and more podcasts of like the left, the progressive case for Bitcoin, socialist case for Bitcoin, because I think Bitcoin is a tool. It's not politically inclined. You know, the communists in, in, in Russia, they used gold and silver because it was a very good way to basically be able to export their grain and and buy machinery from the West that they really needed, you know? So it's like, they didn't say, oh, gold is mainly used by capitalists, so we're not going to use gold. No, they're using it because it's a tool. And then you can have, it's almost like a marketplace of policies. You can see whichever policy is more successful is going to be the policy that, uh, you know, wins wins out and, and takes over the world. So... This is my optimistic video for the depths of the bear market saying it is a better Bitcoin is a better money. And I could actually see, you know, uh, I could actually see a case for some people within the government understanding that this is going to drive to a better outcome for the government itself. Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, the government wants to collect the maximum tax revenue, which is not a bad thing. You know, a good government uses these taxes to help people. And, you know, more efficient, a more efficient economy with more growth will generate a higher tax revenue uh, for, for government. So it's just a matter of the governments to understand it. So, um, yeah, please let me know what you thought of this idea um, by liking, subscribing and uh, dropping us a comment. Otherwise, I hope you have a great post Thanksgiving week and I will talk to you all later.